This could have been the end of an island. One quiet night in 1973, beneath the frozen breath of Iceland, something ancient stirred. Iceland is so volcanic because it straddles a mid-oceanic ridge that runs up the center of the Atlantic Ocean. Without warning, fire erupted from the earth, just a stone's throw from a peaceful fishing town. As lava crept closer, threatening homes, harbor, and hope, the people faced a decision, run or fight. How does the amount produced so far compare with other Icelandic eruptions? Very small so far. Usually uh, there's much lava produced in the beginning of the eruption, yes. but until now there's only a small amount. What happened next wasn't a story of surrender. It became the boldest battle ever waged against a volcano. Armed with seawater and stubborn willpower, they tried to cool molten rock with hoses and pumps. It sounds impossible, but somehow they pulled it off. And this is how they did it. A midnight awakening. No one saw it coming. On January 21st, 1973, a few subtle tremors stirred beneath the ocean floor near Haimai, a small island off Iceland's southern coast. It wasn't unusual. Iceland lives on a fault line, and earthquakes, especially small ones, are part of the landscape. Most of the locals never noticed. There was no panic, no alarm. Life moved along like it always had. But deep beneath the surface, pressure was building. For centuries, the volcano known as Eldfell had slept, showing no signs of life. Then, just before 2 a.m. on January 23rd, the earth split open. A glowing fissure erupted on the island's eastern edge, beginning just a few hundred feet long before tearing across the landscape. Lava burst out violently, and within minutes, a curtain of fire reached into the sky. From that fracture came 40 roaring fountains of molten rock, some leaping 500 feet high. The eruption was only a mile from the town center. That's how close it was, close enough to watch it unfold from your window. Fortunately, a recent storm had kept every fishing boat in port. That twist of fate made escape possible. By morning, nearly all 5,300 residents had evacuated by sea. They left behind their homes, their history, and their harbor. The island burned through the night. Its people watched from a distance, not knowing if they'd ever return. The volcano was awake, and the battle for Jaime had begun. A city on the edge. In just hours, Haimai changed forever. A once quiet fishing village became the stage for a terrifying display of nature's power. The lava didn't flow like a river. It surged like a moving mountain, slow, thick, and unstoppable. Buildings cracked, roads vanished. Ash filled the sky, settling over everything like a gray shroud. By daybreak, the island was coated in falling tephra, by the end of January, some parts were buried under 16 feet of it. But the worst wasn't just the lava, it was where the lava was going. The harbor, the town's lifeline. Jaime wasn't just a home, it was an economic engine. Its fishing operations played a major role in Iceland's GDP. If the harbor closed, the industry would vanish, and so would the town's future. While most people had evacuated, Around 250 brave souls stayed behind. Volunteers, emergency workers, and residents refused to let the island die. They cleared ash off the roofs to stop them from collapsing. They boarded windows to block out firebombs from the sky. They moved furniture and memories out of houses in the lava's path. It quickly became clear that this eruption wasn't just about survival. It was about strategy. They couldn't outrun the lava. They couldn't bury it. But maybe, just maybe, they could stop it or slow it down. That's when the idea started spreading. If the lava was fire, then maybe water was the answer. Not just any water, millions of gallons of seawater. Haimaie would soon attempt the unthinkable. The first battle with fire. February brought the first bold counterattack. Fifteen days into the eruption, lava edged dangerously close to Jaime's vital harbor. If it reached the water and hardened there, the port would be sealed. The town couldn't survive without it. So a risky plan took shape. Spray seawater onto the lava and cool it before it could go any further. Firefighters were the first on the line, dragging long hoses across scorched ground and blasting the molten front. 
seawater hit the lava and vanished in a burst of steam. At first, the results were barely noticeable, but slowly the lava began to harden. The black surface turned brittle. The advance slowed just a little. That was enough to try harder. Soon, more pumps were brought in from the mainland. Ships like the dredging boat Sandy joined the operation, spraying water directly from the sea. It was dangerous, chaotic, and exhausting. The lava didn't stop. It tried new directions, found new weaknesses. Still, a bigger plan formed. Engineers wanted to go further. They envisioned building an entire pipeline network across the lava field, reaching deep into its glowing heart, pumping seawater constantly. It was an idea as wild as the eruption itself, but it was their only chance. The operation wasn't just about saving the harbor, it became a mission to defend the entire island, to stand between civilization and a creeping wall of fire, and to do it with water, steel, and sheer determination. Building a Wall of Steam March rolled in, and with it came the true test. Bulldozers were sent onto terrain that had barely cooled, their tracks grinding over tephra-coated lava flows still glowing underneath. Workers dragged steel pipes across the crust, bolting them together as steam rose around them in thick, choking clouds. Every move had to be careful. There was too much pressure, and the lava could collapse under them. But the bulldozers held their ground. Soon, the pipes stretched hundreds of feet into the lava field. With powerful pumps, some capable of pushing over 250 gallons per second, they began blasting water non-stop. What followed was extraordinary. Lava, who had once crawled steadily forward, began to harden. The black crust thickened, gray walls formed, and slowly, the advance began to stall. But the volcano didn't give up easily. As one front cooled, another opened. The lava oozed in new directions, trying to outflank their efforts. Workers responded by extending the pipes farther, dragging plastic sections filled with water over the fresh crust. Surprisingly, these lightweight pipes survived better than metal ones. They bent with the shifting terrain and didn't crack under pressure. They were building a barrier, one hose at a time, one pipe at a time. And behind that growing wall of cooled lava stood the harbor. Bruised, battered, and scarred, but still intact, for now. The turning point. By late March, the situation had grown even more tense. A fifth of the town was already buried under lava or ash. The harbor's entrance was narrowing by the day. The pumps were working, but they were old and not built for lava wars. Shafts broke, hoses split, and steam made everything slippery and dangerous. Yet they kept going. Then came a breakthrough. From across the Atlantic, help arrived. 32 powerful pumps from the United States, each capable of blasting over 260 gallons of water per second. These weren't makeshift firefighting tools. They were industrial beasts. Within hours of setup, the cooling operation surged into a new phase. With the high-powered pumps now online, the lava slowed dramatically. In some places, it stopped completely. Steam billowed like storm clouds. Lava turned to stone. Roads that had once vanished under fire now became battlegrounds where hoses hissed and workers pressed forward. Still, nothing was easy. The lava's heat was unrelenting. Pipes had to be laid by hand when the terrain grew too rough for bulldozers. Workers were burned. Vision was blocked. The heat was punishing. But the harbor still stood. This was the moment people began to believe they might win. Not escape. Not rebuild but actually stop the volcano. And in doing so, protect everything the island stood for. The lava that fought back. April arrived, and though the pumps roared day and night, the lava didn't go quietly. It changed shape. It changed course. It found new cracks to flow through. Sometimes it would stall, then suddenly surge forward again, like it had just caught its breath. The cooling operation had become a game of high-stakes chess, except the board was on fire and the pieces weighed tons. To keep up, the workers had to innovate on the fly. Bulldozers cut new roads across the lava fields. Plastic pipes, lighter and easier to move, were dragged into position and connected fast. The trick? Fill them with water before laying them down. If empty, 
the heat would melt them like wax. But with cold seawater inside, they held firm, snaking across the blackened landscape like lifelines. One day, they managed to lay a pipeline 650 feet into an active lava field. To do it, a bulldozer crawled over the still-moving lava while men ran behind, joining the pipes. It was dangerous. It was insane. But it worked. And as more seawater poured in, the lava began building up against itself, thickening and piling into walls. Slowly, the tide began to turn. For the first time since January, the people of Haimae had more than hope. They had results. The volcano hadn't stopped. But neither had they holding the line. By May, the cooled lava fields looked like giant scars across the island, gray, cracked, and steaming. But they were more than just remnants of destruction. They were walls. Each section that hardened blocked the lava behind it, slowing the advance toward the harbor and the remaining parts of the city. Still, the volcano kept trying. New breakouts appeared along the edges. Sometimes molten rock oozed over the cooled sections, testing their strength. But every time the pumps were ready, fire hoses blasted water, bulldozers cleared paths, plastic pipes were dragged further in. This became the rhythm of survival. Pump, cool, reinforce, repeat. It wasn't glamorous. Workers were soaked, burned, and covered in ash. The equipment broke down constantly. The steam was so thick it turned day into fog. But the line held. By mid-May, the harbor was no longer in immediate danger. Lava still loomed near, but it no longer moved with the same force. In fact, the cooled lava even began to help. It formed new barriers, higher and tougher than before. The very thing that once threatened to bury the harbor was now protecting it. The people of Haimae had managed the unthinkable. They didn't just run from a volcano. They stood in its path and pushed back, one pipe at a time, one day at a time. Salt, steam, and strategy. As the cooling effort pressed on, the island began to transform in unexpected ways. With every gallon of seawater that hit the lava, something was left behind. Salt. Tons of it. The water evaporated instantly, turning to steam, but the salt stayed. Soon, the hardened lava fields sparkled with thick white crusts, like frost clinging to a battlefield. In total, more than 220,000 tons of salt were deposited across the flow. It looked surreal. Black rock, gray ash, white salt, and endless clouds of steam rising into the sky. From above, it resembled some post-apocalyptic painting. But underneath that strange beauty was a machine of survival. The workers kept expanding the pipeline, deeper and deeper into the lava field. At one point, they extended over 420 feet beyond the flow front. The deeper they went, the harder it got. The terrain was unstable, pipes cracked, steam burned. Even visibility was a constant issue. But the team adapted. They used insulated steel and water-filled plastic pipes. They moved fast, even when the ground shifted under their boots. By July, over 1.9 billion gallons of seawater had been pumped across the lava. The flow began to weaken. The eruption was slowing down. And the people, though exhausted, were still holding the line. This wasn't just a cooling mission. It was control. Slow, stubborn control over a force of nature. From destruction to rebirth. By early July, the eruption finally stopped. No more lava surged from the crater. The island exhaled slowly as if it too had survived a battle. The damage was immense, homes lost, streets buried, and factories destroyed. But something strange had happened. Against every odd, Jaime still stood. And so did the harbor. When the smoke cleared, they took stock. Around 8.8 .8 billion cubic feet of lava and ash had been expelled, but not all of it caused destruction. About one square mile of new land had been added to the island, increasing its area by nearly 20%. Ironically, what once threatened to choke the harbor now shielded it. The cooled lava formed a natural breakwater, giving the port better protection from future storms. By 1974, fishing companies were back in business. A year later, 85% of the population had returned. 
Streets were cleared. New homes were built, some even on reclaimed lava land. And where the lava had cooled but still held heat, it was tapped. Scientists realized the flows retained incredible geothermal energy. By 1974, homes were already using that heat for hot water and electricity. The eruption didn't just destroy, it transformed. It challenged a community, and the community answered. And in that answer, they didn't just survive, they built something stronger, a legacy forged in fire. Even now, decades later, the story of Haimae feels unreal. An island faced a wall of fire, and instead of fleeing forever, its people stayed. They battled a volcano not with bombs or barriers, but with seawater, steel pipes, and grit. What they did wasn't just brave, it was unprecedented. Nothing of this scale had ever been tried before. And it worked. The harbor was saved. The town returned. The eruption that could have erased Jaime from the map became a story of defiance. A story of ordinary people taking on the fury of the earth and forcing it to stop. In time, the lava fields cooled. Tourists began to visit, drawn by the strange beauty of black rock and white salt. Some walked paths that once flowed with molten stone. Others came to see the volcano itself, still classified as active, though silent since 1973. The eruption changed more than just the landscape. It reshaped lives. The forced evacuation, oddly enough, led to higher incomes and better education for the island's younger generation. And the geothermal heat from the lava provided energy for years after the eruption ended. What began as a disaster ended as a remarkable display of innovation and human spirit. Jaime didn't just survive its volcano, it rewrote the rules of what survival could look like. This wasn't just a story about a volcano. It was about people who refused to give up, who faced fire with water and turned panic into precision. What happened on Jaime in 1973 wasn't just a fight for survival. It was a lesson in resilience, creativity, and unity. The island was scarred, but it was never broken. From molten chaos, a stronger community emerged, proving that sometimes nature doesn't have the final word. And maybe that's what makes this story unforgettable. Not the eruption, but the answer to it. When the earth roared, Haimai didn't run. It stood, and it won.